sessions of the uh, Colonel Miniconf. Um, up next, we have Thomas Schobel-Toyer uh, presenting on Easy Geo Redundancy with Mars. Please welcome Thomas. Thank you. I'm from One and One, which is a European web hosting company, and I'm the only kernel developer there. Uh, I have a backup, which is a junior, he's a junior from the university, and uh, a few times a year I can talk with him about security problems, but he's doing user space work, actually. So all I will present you is practically from myself. And, well, I have been working upstreams more than 20 years ago. The de-entry cache in the kernel is for me, but I have not worked uh, only a few months in the kernel, and then I, had, I was working a different story here. What I will talk about is, first, some background, how Mars has evolved and the reasons why it's existing. And then, of course, what for a kernel hacker audience, it's important to know the differences to what's already in the kernel, what's the architectural differences with respect to the RBD, and uh, in particular with respect to the device mapper. There are some differences. And, uh, of course, current status, future plans, and I think the main point for me is to get some feedback from you in the, dis in the discussion, what should I do to bring it upstream? So, otherwise, what do I need from you in order to bring it upstream? So it's a, a problem to be resolved. First, I will explain for upstream hackers what downstream is actually meaning. I will try to explain it. So if you are responsible, I'm personally responsible for a system which is uh, for kernel, for downstream kernel, which is deployed to more than 10,000. I think in the moment it's about 15,000 servers in total. We have the shared hosting with 9 millions of customers. I explain it on the next slide. And plus managed root servers is a total of around this number of machines. What I'm doing is rather similar to when you know the Debian development model. It's like Quilt or Patch Stack on top of an upstream kernel. So my most frequent operation is Git rebase, of course. Uh, what I'm doing, um, at the moment I have around 360 patches, excluding Mars, Mars is on top of all of it. Then several problems to be solved in downstream. Priority number one is maintain the SLA. It's 99.98, almost four nines percent. End to end, I will explain it on the next slide. Then a few parts are from GR security because one and one has used GR security even before I entered the company. And you all know what happened to GR security in spring of 2017, you know it. And uh, this also impacted uh, my downstream work because I had to port, I had to split the Jumbo patch into some uh, parts for, for my internal work. We had used only 29 features from the many hundred fe uh, features, uh, config options of GR security. And at the moment, I've stuck, I'm stuck at having ported nine of them, and the rest, 20, are yet missing. And I have no time, at the moment I had no time, including Mars and other things, for doing that. Then a lot of security features. One highlight is the persistent file monitor too. Uh, if you operate a system with billions of inodes, and you want a user space daemon with FS notify. Then you always have a consistency problem if something is going wrong here. So you have unnoticed loss of, uh, of information if the daemon doesn't exactly start when it should start and exactly shut down in the right moment. So I have a special kernel patch which directly persists uh, the file system events for, for incremental backup in the file system in a special directory, and it's uh, race-free because the U-mount and the mount system calls are activating or deactivating that. So similar to the quota system by concept. And if uh, you press the power button and lose some data, you, you have a super block information and know uh, you had a data loss. And then, of course, you need a, a, full, a full scan of the file system again. Okay, so this is what I'm working on, and it eats more than 100% of my capacity, and this is to be discussed later what this means for upstream work. So our SLA, as mentioned, is almost four nines, end-to-end, -end, measured from an external data center, which means even not only network outages or 
simple PHP problems, but also any add sysadmin errors, whatever, is, is already there in. And we typically meet this. Uh, I think in the last years you have only missed it one or two, two times, and it was almost always due to networking problems. And this means that the actual state of Mars is super stable. So uh, this priority number one is not only my downstream kernel, specialized things and finding and fixing bugs, but also with respect to Mars. I, I don't know the, the real reliability of Mars itself, but it must be much, much, much better, as far as I know. So the working environment where we have, uh, we have uh, around five petabytes in the meantime, in four data centers, and we, in each continent, we are running two data centers with a distance of about 50 kilometers, with geo redundancy. And uh, some millions of customer home directories, some billions of inodes, and as mentioned, the file monitor true patch I have developed is for ensuring that incremental daily backup works uh, without uh, find operations in the file system. Because uh, if, if you try to do that, it's, it's a blaze. Okay, and what you would like uh, is what's quite unusual. We'll use local storage because it's better. Uh, you don't believe it. All uh, guys in the storage area are thinking that network storage is a must. But local storage is, first, it's faster, and it's even the same flexibility thanks to some solution I uh, uh, developed on top of Mars. You can migrate containers in the background, uh, uh, logical volumes in the LXC containers on top of them in background while the data is being modified. And this migration can be used, for example, to migrate a container. If you have 10 containers on a box and it grows too big, then you migrate away one to another empty box or to, uh, where there's enough space. And then you can expand uh, first the logical volume, then Mars RDM resize, and then XFS underscore growFS, for example. So then you have more space, just, just as an example, how to manage that. It's, it's no problem, it's solved here. The so-called football project. Well, then what is probably interesting, why is Mars existing? It's an interesting history. Uh, one, one started in about the project started even before I entered the company, but when I entered it in 2008, uh, the project finished in 2009, DRBD was used, it was the first attempt uh, for solving the geo redundancy over 50 kilometers. And the reason why I have developed MERS is original lab testing, which has not been done by me, was a, an ordinary sync rate, which is, well, we were at that time, one gigabit uplinks were the ordinary standard technology, and at more than half of this speed was reachable, and so there was no problem. The old system architects were thinking. But a few years later, the sync rate, if you need a full sync for some reason, like split brain, and uh, split brain, but you have a loss of a, of a machine or whatever, uh, then it dropped down to about five megabytes se per second. We had um, to throttle it down. Why? What do you think? What, what could be the reason? The problem is that DRBD has one TCP connection per resource. So over this TCP connection, you have three types of traffic. Mars has a solution for it. It has separate ports and separate connections for each of these traffic types here below. The metadata traffic in Mars, it's a symlink tree in DRBD. You need some state exchange about the finite automaton state of DRBD. Then you have the ordinary replication traffic also in DRBD. And of course, you have the sync traffic if you want to, mig to migrate the data and so on. And all of this is going over one single TCP connection. So it's like a highway which has only one track in one direction. Ordinarily, you are driving a BMW or Porsche or Ferrari or something, and you know in Germany there's no speed limit, so you can drive 200, no problem. But when suddenly the highway is jammed, you have a traffic jam by trucks because you are starting the sync operation. It's a huge bulk data to be transferred now, and nothing, so you, know, you are stuck in the traffic jam. That's the problem, simply explained. 
So this was the reason why I started Mars first in my spare time uh, upon my personal initiative. There was no originally no one-on-one -on -one project for it, and after I have shown it to some uh, people higher in the hierarchy, then I suddenly got a project and some support for it. And um, yes, and this is the reason why Mars existed. There was an in interesting thing before I really started it. We asked Limbit for a fix for this. So we asked them, we would pay it, please a new feature request, we pay you for the new feature, please provide a second TCP connection for the sync traffic. So you have two lines in, and uh, the trucks have a separate lines from your BMW or whatever wants to drive fast. And uh, after a while we got the answer, no, they won't do it. And that's, that, this was the real reason why I then was clear I have to do it in a different way. Okay, then one explanation for the DRBD problems we accounted. This is a lab testing scenario here. In this scenario, we are assuming it's an, in lab testing that the DRBD write throughput is constant here and that the network has a limit which is decreasing linearly in this example, just for lab testing. And if you do this, it's an interesting behavior. Once uh, the request of throughput cannot be satisfied, it starts rambling a little bit, and after a while it does, it does an automatic disconnector. Depending on configuration, you can try a reconnect or do it automatically, so it, it, cannot, it can never succeed, it's clear, because information theoretic limits does not work. And of course, after the pause, you have an additional traffic, an additional throughput for resync, because in the meantime, the bitmap has recorded some more changes, and this is additional uh, load, which also has to be transferred, and it can never run this way. And uh, the point is the RBD has a bitmap which does not record the order of the write, write request. And if you interrupt it you, again during this resync, then your mirror is inconsistent because the original write order is violated. It's clear to you. Yeah, so, so you have no record of the original order of the writes. So some parts of the newer version, some parts of the other one. And in some incident scenarios, it can happen that your mirror is permanently inconsistent. So it fails exactly in the moment when you, want, when you desperately need your replica at the other side. And this is the problem to be solved by Mars. In the next slide, if you have the same scenario, constant application throughput, and you have this network throughput, of course, the green line, the actual replication traffic by Mars is parallel, in parallel, uh, slightly below, of course, uh, this line, and it's buffered in the persistent transaction log, so-called transaction log of Mars. So this is the information theoretic best possible behavior. Here's a practical example. Example you have here, TCP send buffer. This is much smaller by factors, by, by orders of magnitude than the transaction log. And in case of a networking problem, even an outage or whatever, uh, it's uh, buffering as much as you want, and it's catching up afterwards if you have enough transport ca capacity. I have checked uh, the cross data center links in our company, and uh, the congestion is an interesting problem. The throughput is uh, sometimes declining by a factor more than by two orders of magnitude for a very short time, and then it's up again and so on. So it's a runtime behavior with some type uh, like packet storms and similar. And uh, this is the reason why DRBD did not work. DRBD uh, works very well and excellent if you have a crossover cable, rack to rack replication. This is the use case where it has been constructed for. So DRBD isn't obsolete by Mars, obviously, but Mars is just covering a different use case here. Okay, now internals, some internals of Mars for, for kernel hackers. Here's just a highlight. Uh, let, let's explain it systematically. Okay, so we have a virtual device, DEF, Mars, MyData, and the backup device or the, the backing device is DEF, Logical Volume, volume Group, MyData. And the content is the same. This is the device, uh, physical device or the logical volume to be replicated. Then you have a kernel module with a temporary kernel memory buffer. It starts with size zero and it can grow up to a limit configurable limit, and if you have no traffic anymore, then it will shrink down to size zero again. So it's a dynamic buffer. So if your write request is coming down from here, it's appended to the transaction log file, and once it's 
completed, so you get the completion, the callback. It's uh, then then I call back to the application. It's written because now if the power fails, all the data is present in the transaction log file. And if you know MySQL or other databases, they have a recovery phase after power fail. Mars is working the same way. You have a recovery phase after after startup, of course. So this is no problem to be healed. And now the point is. Um, this temporary memory buffer cannot grow indefinitely. It's impossible, so you need to write the data into the block device, but it need not be written in the original order because the, the transaction log re already records the original order. So and I'm using this, I'm reordering according to sector numbers, ascending sector numbers, and this is a performance, a performance booster. If you have RAID 6, where the writes are very expensive, then ordering according to sec scanning sector number is actually meaning that the seek distance are minimized and that you can merge some adjacent blocks in some cases, and that the RAID 6 algorithm, of course, will work better when it has a larger striping. And I have some measurements. You can see it in the Mars user manual for sysadmins. Uh, I will show you the link later. I have a scenario with our workload measured with block, uh, with block uh, trace and replayed with block replay, and uh, I, see, I see a speed up of more than a factor of two with our hardware we currently have. So this is, and I know of people who are using the Mars not for replication, but just for boosting the, the speed here, because there are use cases where Mars uh, delivers the uh, uh, nearly near, uh, similar performance, not, uh, well, it's not near SSDs, but you don't need SSDs, SSDs anymore for a certain use case. Uh, the rest of the story is simple. If you know MySQL replication, it's clear what's happening with the log file. It's verbatim copied by a replicator thread uh, to the secondary side. You can have multiple secondaries in parallel, of course. So, and uh, so the files are identical. In case your network is down, you can copy it uh, to a USB stick and manually transfer it to the other side, potentially possible, so it's exactly the same data. You can MD5 checksum it in case you are mistrusting it, and so on. And uh, the last, sorry, the last thing, I see I pushed the wrong button, is an applicator which is applying it to the secondary mirror exactly in the original order. So this is very similar to MySQL replication. Any questions for this? Hopefully it's clear. So current status of Mars. It's on GitHub, it's on GPL, obviously, because it's a kernel module, and I have very thorough documentation for it. There are two important manuals. The first one is uh, Mars Architecture Guide, which is an intro for, uh, also for manager, intended for manager. My boss uh, has tweaked me and has coached me uh, with man manager speak, and I've tried to address also uh, managers in this guide, but also system architects. And for you as a kernel hacker, as kernel hackers, it's hopefully also an, uh, an uh, exciting reading. It has, uh, I think, 130 pages. It's almost like a PhD thesis. No, not yet, uh, but, but uh, in, in a similar way. And it uh, explains a lot of things around storage in general and about architectures. For example, I have a mathematical proof that big cluster architectures are worse than these Mars sharding architectures uh, in general. So the Mars and DRBD sharding model used uh, at one and one is probably the most reliable architecture at architectural level, architectural reliably. Not, not uh, uh, implementation, of course, can worsen it, but the model as such. Well, and for sysadmins, there's a user manual with step-by-step -step instructions. You can also check it if you like. And there's the performance thing I mentioned. It's productive since a few years. It's the backbone of our geo-redundancy features, which has been publicly advertised for years now. Uh, and now to the kernel part. At the moment, due to my downstream work situation, I'm only supporting LTS kernels at the moment because uh, that's one of the problems uh, I have because I have no time for getting to the latest development kernel at the moment. So these are LTS kernels. 3.2 is out end of life now, but I just managed last month to get it to 4.14. 
And of course, more work is needed because I have to maintain the Cartesian product of Mars versions and kernel versions in some sense. And this requires a lot of testing. Uh, I've tried to be as less intrusive to the kernel as possible. So there's one pre-patch which changes the kernel slightly. There's only a few export symbol statements because I'm using some interfaces which are not yet exported. That's all which is intrusive into the kernel. The rest is completely independent from the kernel. So when I will go upstream, hopefully there is no impact or almost practically no impact onto the rest of the kernel. Exactly, not exactly zero, but almost zero. It's only a few export symbols and that's all. So this is a strategy from here, but otherwise I couldn't survive this and it would be unmaintainable, of course. Uh, well, and inside of Mars, I will explain you some, uh, some highlights, how I do the backward compatibility. Our sysadmins are used to upgrade procedure as follows. You have a primary data center where you typically are running the services and at the secondary data center side you are deploying a new Mars version or a new kernel, including Mars version. So, and for some days or even for a week or longer, both Martians, Mars versions must be able to communicate even, they, even if there's a new feature in the new version, okay? And then after a while, this hand over to the other side, and even days or weeks later, then they will update the old, sec uh, old primary side also. And this is uh, the procedure they are used to for years. And I know of no break, uh, of, an, of any non-breaking change. As there was no break in the meantime. Current density, um, we have around seven to 10 logical volumes, and one logical volume is one LXC container. And um, interestingly, the football project, which has increased the density, has led to half of uh, TCO. So I think uh, with respect to TCO, it's unbeatable. So I know of no other storage system because our machines are pizza boxes with local storage. There's no cheaper way. We have no storage network at all, but only replication network which need not be dimensioned for real-time I.O. That's the point. So it's much cheaper than anything else on the market. Self-built storage, uh, self-built st software stack, and standard hardware, in this case Dell servers, as you can, standard server, and that's it, with some local hardware-based rate. Okay, with BBU, the BBU is important for performance. Now, you as a kernel hacker are probably interested in the differences, architectural differences. DRBD is probably known to you. It's structured like a classical device driver. You know the activity log and bitmap. Data and metadata is sent over the same TCP connection and the model is a strict consistency model for crossover cables. Mars is very different. It's an instance-oriented brick architecture. I will explain it in the next slides what it means. Then the data structures are not the global ones by concept, but each is inside of bricks, so it's in a black box. And the wiring between the bricks is uh, irreplaceable with client server bricks, so you can make a distributed system out of it at any, potentially at any place, wherever you want uh, to have, uh, to distribute it. It's a strict separation by concept of data versus metadata, and the Networking model is not strictly consistent, but eventually consistent. This is necess necessary for long distance replication. So then the next question could arise, why didn't I use the device mapper? Well, there's an explanation here. Device mapper is firmly bound to struct bio. And here in, in the next slide, you will see that the transaction log needs odd addresses on the device or on the file. Uh, be, because otherwise checksumming and uh, compression and other features uh, would, would be a little bit complicated. So the struct MREF object I'm using in Mars, it's a little bit similar to struct bio, but it's for both block and file IO. It has not the restrictions of sector alignment. Wiring is different. Here we have a tree structure. In Mars we have an arb almost arbitrary graph structure, it can, but no cycles, of course. But uh, so it's more general in this respect. And an important feature is the dynamic rewiring during the runtime while the I.O. is flying. And this is needed for transaction uh, log rotate. Uh, 
operation, because for a very short time the old transaction log is not yet fully written, the new one is already started. So flying I.O. requests in parallel to two files at the same time. And this is a must feature, otherwise it won't work, and as far as I know the device mapper wouldn't support it, at least not easily. The next architectural difference is the interfaces here in this generic brick infrastructure. You could use it for future personalities for different things, not only block layer. For example, you could use it also at the file system layer. So if it goes kernel upstream, you can use it for different types of interfaces. And these interface types are potentially object-oriented, object so inheritance. And the bricks themselves has an aspect-oriented design I will explain in the next slide. So this is the heart of my presentation. What's about bricks, objects, and aspects? This is an example. We start at the top here, Def Mouse My Data is this virtual block device. And of course, it's struck bio, as always, in the kernel. And it's now this mouse interface brick is translating to, between the external struct bio, which is arriving here, and makes an MREF object out of it, or several ones, depending on, well, you have the biovec uh, substructure, and for each biovec or whatever, it's merging something. But it's not a one-to-one -one relationship between bio and uh, the MREF object. And then automatically, an if aspect is attached to it, which carries some data which is specific to this brick instance here, mouse if okay, interface. And if it passes down this wiring, this is uh, an input, this is an output of the next brick, it's wired, then it goes to the transaction logger, and automatically a transaction logger aspect is attached, where some state information can be kept. And this attachment is dynamic. Uh, depending on which brick you are actually entering. So the transaction logger might forward it to this input or to the other input, depending on what's going on. And read request is typically forwarded directly to, to the block device. And there's no conflict with a conflicting write in the memory buffer. While if it's written to the transaction log, you have uh, to copy the data and to check some it in several hour operations into the transaction log. And then you have a transaction log request. Potentially, the same MREF could be reused. But in this case, of course, I'm, you, I'm using new MREFs for the transaction log. And upon the completion path, then it's signaled here. And then you have the write back, uh, which can even be done with the original. MRF. So the deallocation is not at the same time, not, need, not, not, need not be at the same time when the completion can occur. So this is the basic idea. These are also adapters. This adapts obviously to the biostruct of the underlying block device. And here it's, I'm using the AIO. It's a user space concept and it has some drawback because it's table based. And this is not no good idea for kernel, but as a downstream developer, I don't want to directly access the page cache, which would be possible if I would be upstream. Uh, of course, it would be much better or using the dio, uh, direct I.O. infrastructure, even, even, probably even better. But there are no export symbols at the moment. And this was my method of abstraction. This is, of course, not, uh, not the best one, but current, current status in order to be to not uh, intrusive to the kernel. That's the idea here. Now the next highlight, client and server bricks. So there's an, uh, here the data is arriving. You have a client. And now the data is converted to network transport, TCP sockets. And the so-called socket bundling features mean there can be several in parallel with load balancing between them, like in iSCSI or similar. The default, current default is two parallel TCP connections. This, this is the lesson learned from the DRVD problems. And of course, you can scale it up. Current maximum is eight, but compile time constant. Or if you have a very slow network, you can, of course, use only TCP connection. Of course, then the performance will suffer. So in future, of course, you can implement further transport because it's abstracted away. The transport doesn't matter here. It's a low level thing. And what's important, in contrast to DRBD, you don't have a separate reconnect operation. So if the network is breaking down, of course, the TCP connections will uh, stop working somewhere. And of course, we'll auto even automatically use uh, some, some socket options in order to keep alive options in order to automatically manage that, that problem. 
And in case the network is coming up again, it will automatically reconnect transparently. So the networking, the distributed memory model is, the distributed model is, a message may take an arbitrary time. It may be very fast, it may take five minutes or whatever. So this is transparent here. Any questions for this? Well, then the next interesting thing which is unusual is the so-called symlink tree in Mars. Metadata means, for example, the configuration data and other things. And in 2010, when I implemented it, I was looking for a persistent key value store. And uh, the problem was I could implement it myself in the kernel space or not. I could also have implemented in user space, but implementing in user space would have been a political issue in one on one because then the strategy of the company was it has to be implemented in Java, full stop. Because this was the company's strategy at that time. Unfortunately, I resisted to that because the team, the Java teams, are no longer existent today at all. This team doesn't exist anymore. Even the user space tool, Maus ADM, would have been written in Java then. And uh, instead, it's a Perl script. So, well, uh, I got an exception, of course, kernel space. But at that time, it was politically impossible uh, to do it in, in a different way. That's the reason why several things are in kernel space and not in user space. It's also a question could arise, but, well, it's, it's history, simply. I simply didn't get the time uh, to implement a known kernel space uh, persistent memory, and that's the reason why the symlink tree is a misuse of symlinks for a key value store. It's an example in the last two lines. The idea is to replicate the whole tree throughout the cluster, so it's potential it is identical on each host, on each cluster member the same tree. You could even transport it via rsync if necessary, at least in theory. Uh, and the idea is name clashes can be avoided by the origin host name. Who has created the symlink or who is responsible for the symlink, who is updating this symlink is encoded in the path. And here we have two examples. The first is a non-shared symlink. This is the designated primary host. It points, says host R should be primary, host A should be primary. And this symlink is not per host specific because it's a global, as per, per resource global variable. It means host A should be the primary, and the actual primary, or the actual primaries, and there may be several primaries in a split brain situation. So several primaries may be actually, they didn't know of each other due to network outage. And it can happen that several ones are actually primary, and the di distinction is by the host name in this case, it's even in the directory name. So I have a directory which is per host, and then I have several sub symlinks in that for scalability. OK. And the end time is corresponding to the Lamprot timestamp. And Lamprot protocol, Lamprot clock means that the last timestamp will always win. So it's the consistency model is eventually consistent. And the Lamprot time tells you who is the winner of the race conditions, which naturally occur in any dis long distance distributed system. So it's race compensation via Lambert clock. That's the basic idea. Any questions for this? OK, then Mars future plans. We can shorten this if you like. If you have questions, you can ask. This is what I'm currently working about. So I have new checksumming algorithms. The MD5 is very slow, uh, the traditional one used in Mars. I have the CRC32. C is much faster by a factor of 10. It's already in the kernel due to networking, of course. And log file compression and uh, independently from the transport compression can help for some use cases. And in order to implement all of this, transaction log file format is extended. And uh, I have a special data structure, which is called struct meta. It's um, describing an arbitrary C structure in the kernel, and it's used for marshalling and demarshalling over the network. So if I add a new field to a, reg to, to a struct, then it's by default, uh, if it's not present in the old version, so can have intermixed operation of old and new versions, old client versions, new uh, server version, or vice versa, then it's automatically detected that there's a new field and it's left empty if the other side doesn't have it. 
and otherwise, of course, it's copied over. So it's ensuring compatibility even if the data structure and the offsets in the record have changed and in, 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 in the structures have changed. Okay. And of course, the next slide or the last slide of my talk is about kernel upstreaming. So how to get it upstream? Here I see some problems because I'm overloaded with more than 100%. I'm the only one developer for downstream. And I'm already filled up to more than 100% in my ordinary work queue. And some of Mars development, or much of it, is even in my spare time already. So spare time is not the solution to upstreaming, to kernel upstreaming. And I uh, have some suggestions here, but probably there are some more. And if I could get some feedback from you, some help, would highly appreciate it. Uh, the first idea is before going upstream, the out of three version could be supported by some upstream hackers. Best is a senior and also for coaching me. Because my experience with upstream is 20 years old and much has changed. It's not only Git, but the, the procedures, the habits, and man, many things are different now from the old, good old times. So this is probably, uh, the solutions are non-exclusive here. So this would be, I think, at least very helpful for me, to get some help from the community. And of course, uh, I, I got some first response a years ago when I tried first. I should replace the symlink first by some better data structure. Of course, it's a good idea because scalability will be improved. But it costs some time, and the, uh, I have to check the user base. The user base, uh, base is expecting that it's backwards compatible. So I need at least a migration script from the old data format to the new one. Best would be even if I had the old version, two versions running in parallel and checking which client or server side has which ver version and using the old data format in parallel to the new one for some intermediate time, which is, of course, much more work and needs some thorough testing and so on. Some solution is needed here. I cannot ignore the user base, the petabytes of data. And I know that it's not only used in Germany. It's also used in Australia here. I have some feedback from some people for, en for enterprise critical workloads. So I, I have to, this user base cannot be left in the rain. I cannot, cannot leave them. OK, then the other solution would be I should get rid of downstream work. And that means I should change my employer somewhere. I have tried in one and one whether it's possible, but uh, there's no interest in it. I've asked my boss, and it's not his personal opinion I know from him, but uh, th th there's no priority for it. I can do it, but there's no priority. And this translates to I have to do it in my spare time. And this is just not the way to go. Alone reading the LKMA mailings and filtering all uh, the postings is almost a full-time job. So I cannot do both, upstream and downstream at the same time. So hopefully there's some sponsor who is willing to use Mars or either a distro, of course, for uh, in, in, the, in the core business. So this would be a possible solution. And I think Mars is already proved to be ready for enterprise critical workloads. And it also will be the case when it's upstream, of course. So this would be the goal. Keeping this SLA, this reliability, and of course, improving things. And of course, bringing some things upstream, which hopefully is also of interest for other kernel hackers, like the instance-oriented brick infrastructure, the objects, aspects, and so on, and struct meta for marshalling, demarshalling. All is hopefully usable in other parts of the kernel because it's generic. So this is, I think, the, what I can offer to the community. Of course, the community should also someone have some decision whether to accept or not. But if it's willing to accept it and they need some work, I am willing to do this. And we need to find a setup for this. So we have a few minutes left for discussion. Is it true? Andrew, yes. You will moderate it, please. One question here, yeah. Uh, thank you for uh, 
the talk. I have a question. Um, what happens with Mars if a slave is much slower than master? So uh, the slave log uh, increases in size, and at the point when we have, have to migrate from master to slave, we, uh, the slave is out of date. So in, um, I mean, in MySQL uh, world, we have a special solution for uh, slow slaves, like a semi-synchronous replication when slow, uh, slaves uh, uh, sense to the master uh, how far it's from, from the current point. I don't understand. Oh, oh, I don't understand your question fully, but um, Mars is very different in architecture than DRBD. In DRBD, you have the push principle. The primary is responsible for the state of the secondary. Mars is different. The primary is only responsible for itself, and that's it. The secondary is responsible for fetching the data, and that means you have decoupled the responsibility of primary versus secondary. Does it answer your question or not? Not exactly. Uh, no. Suppose we, uh, the master is much uh, faster than slave. You, so ah, it you, sends a lot of data and slave uh, is Ah, OK. Data. okay. So you are talking happens? about uh, the data rate. The, the write rate is much higher than uh, the network transports. Of course, in average, the network, network transports must be good enough. Otherwise, it will run full. And then the so-called emergency mode will occur. So it means uh, transaction logging is stopped, then it directly, I can go back to the slide explaining it. No, this is the wrong, sorry, it was the wrong button. Go back, uh, go to the function, uh, to, to this slide. Okay, so it stops transaction logging here, no written anymore, directly writing through, but the secondary is left in a consistent state, but outdated, of course. And then after, this has been resolved, the network is working again. Uh, first of all, you can resize the file system here. If you have enough disk space, just uh, X4, uh, X4 uh, extend the X4 or whatever file system here. And then uh, you can survive this way. Uh, you can transport the data by hand. If it's, uh, typical dimensioning in one and one is around half a terabyte for slash Mars, and typically this lasts for several days. Only a few machines uh, are high load machines, and then it lasts only a few hours then, of course. So uh, when the emergency mode occurs, uh, the mirror is consistent but outdated. And then afterwards, you can do a fast full sync. And fast full sync means, um, similar to our sync, each block is read uh, in both devices, and then an MD5 checksum, or the new checksumming method is com computed and compared block by block. So you have the same network traffic or similar network traffic than if DRBD and its bitmaps, but Mars at the moment doesn't use bitmaps. Of course, if it's upstream, you can add some bitmaps to it, and you have almost the same I.O. performance. So it computes the MD5 checksums, which is more expensive, yes, of course, but the problem is solved. And this fast checksumming method is extremely important for this migration in the football project. So you can create another replica. The sync is running in parallel over a different port number, and this leads to, no, uh, typically the sync is not uh, hindering in any way the performance, because um, rate controllers uh, typically have an I.O. parallelism of about 1,000 requests. In parallel, you have to, to tune uh, the, the request numbers in the block layer, number of requests, and then you have really high I.O. parallelism on this machine, and I'm exploiting this in the current Mars version. Of course, everything is tunable. Does it answer your question? Yes. Okay, no. Now it's clear. Oh, well, it's described in the user manual, not in the ar architecture manual. Um, we might have to bring questions to a close. Uh, Uh, thank you very much, Thomas, for your talk. And if you've got any further questions, I'm sure you'll be able to find him uh, around the place. Yes, you, you can. Of course, you can ask me. And I will be at, at, uh, at, the, uh, at the dinner tomorrow and so on. Just, just look at my badge and you will find me again. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much.